Colossians 3, 1 through 17. So as many of you are aware, if you've been tuning in for any length of time or have been coming to Trinity for any length of time, that we are in a series, a series we started about a month ago, we've titled Apples and Oranges. Apples and Oranges, as we look at Galatians 5.22, and we look specifically at the fruit of the Spirit, hence the name Apples and Oranges. We started out, and we're just going down in order, we started out with a couple series on, or a couple messages on love, then we went to joy, and then we are on peace, and this will be the final one on peace. I said peace would take about three messages, and last week we took a break and let Gina from Genesis Outreach speak. I thought she did a great job. I heard from a lot of you all that you really appreciated it. She's not a, she's not a preacher, not a pastor, is the CEO, but I thought did a wonderful job talking about mercy and, and the like. So today we are going to finish up with peace, and then if you're into Galatians 5.22, you'll see what follows, love, joy, peace, patience, and so then next week you know that we'll be going into patience. But as we're finishing the few messages on peace, I'm hoping this works today. Gotta love technology. All right. So, we are finishing up on peace. So, three weeks ago, we talked about peace. We talked about false peace and the idea of being a peacekeeper versus a peacemaker. And we talked about conflict avoidance as false peace and what real peace looks like. And then two weeks, ago, two weeks ago, we looked at the three types of peace that the Bible talks to us about, the peace that we can have with God because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, the peace that we're supposed to have with each other, which is getting harder and harder to find in our world, and then the peace that we have internally, peace of mind, freedom from fears, cares, and anxieties. And then this week, we're going to look at peace in a different way. Today's message, if you could do the little word thing up there, picture game, today's message is called Peace Pursuers. Peace Pursuers. And we're going to look at a specific passage in the Bible Mocha just read it to us, and we're going to look at the characteristics of being a peacemaker instead of a peacekeeper. Psalms 34 and 14 says, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. And we're going to get most of today's scripture reading, again, out of the Colossians verses that Mokta just read. They're all on your screen. It's specific, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. I'll read them again. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. And it's going to be out of these verses that we get today's message. In verse 12, we see three specific characteristics that are to make up our identity. Our identity as God's people and our identity as peacemakers. Three things in verse 12. First, we are God's people. We cannot make peace without God. Impossible. We can't make a bowl of cereal without God, let alone peace. We are holy, it says, holy, set apart, separated. And in a world that is where it's harder and harder to find peace, our light should shine all the brighter, amen? Amen. The darker the dark, the brighter the light. 
So not only are we God's people and we are holy, but because of all of this, in, in, in encapsulating all this, it says we are dearly loved. And if you don't understand your identity as a beloved child of God, making peace with God, making peace with your neighbor, and even having peace in yourself will be very, very hard. We are God's chosen people. We are holy, set apart, and we are loved. You know me, I always like when we get to go to the foreign language part of today's message. Usually I like to teach you a little Hebrew or a little Greek. Today I'm going to teach you a little Latin. You guys are getting so smart. I hope you guys take advantage of this and like go play Jeopardy with your friends. They'll be like, it's like Pastor Dave, he's making us smart. All right, so look at this, and I'm going to try to go through it. Latin's not my first tongue. Qua amasti me, feciti me ama bailem. I looked it up, the pronunciation, and it's a quote from St. Augustine, one of the fathers of the church, and here's what it means. In loving me, you made me lovable. That's so beautiful. I'm going to say it again because it's not on the screen. It translates in, in loving me, you made me lovable. Because God first loved us, we're able to love. Listen to this quote from pastor and author J.I. Packer. There is tremendous relief in knowing that his love, God's love to me, is utterly realistic. It's based at every point on his prior knowledge of the worst about me. So that no discovery now can disillusion him about me. In the way I am so often disillusioned about myself and I quench his determination to bless me. For some unfathomable reason, he wants me as his friend and desires to be my friend. And has given his son to die for me in order to realize this purpose. That's beautiful. His love for me is utterly realist, realistic. Based at every point on prior knowledge about the worst of me. So that no discovery can disillusion him. Oh, but if you only knew. Well, God does. Right? That's what we hear all the time. Oh, pastor, but if you only knew. Okay. But God does. And the one who knows you best loves you most. And it's because of this love that we can be peace pursuers. And so going back to Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, we see eight characteristics that will make up a godly peacemaker. Eight characteristics that need to define our lives if we're to pursue peace. They're each just one or two words for those taking notes. I'll expound on them a little bit. But eight things Paul writes us in Colossians that need to define our lives as godly peacemakers. Number one, compassion. And again, these are found in Colossians 3, 12 through 14. The first one is compassion. Compassion requires three things. Compassion re requires the ability to see, the ability to feel, and the ability to act. We have to see the suffering around us, amen? We have to be visible to it. And that's why we have to go into the margins. That's why we can't open the church doors anymore and wait for people to come when God has sent us to go out to a lost and dying world. Amen? We have to be close enough, right? I said it a few weeks ago. We have to be close enough to feel their pain so that we're close enough for them to feel our love. So we have to see suffering. But we just can't see it and turn a blind eye. We have to feel we have to be moved. It says in the scriptures, and Jesus was moved with compassion. 
So compassion requires us to see, and then compassion requires us to feel, but even that's not enough. I could see suffering and feel bad, it still turned the other way. But third, it requires action. True compassion requires action. I've said many times over the course of my time here that in the Hebrew language, love is an action verb. It is a verb, it's not a noun, it is to do something. And so to be compassionate, like the Bible says, be compassionate, be holy, be perfect, like your heavenly Father is compassionate, we have to see, we have to feel, and we have to act. The Christian, then, is to be a man of pity, a man who cannot see suffering or need or distress without a sword of grief and pity piercing his own heart. There could be no more complete opposites than callousness and Christianity. That's good. What did they charge you to come in today? Was it free again? Because that's, that's worth the price of admission right there. There is a complete, there is no more complete opposite than callousness and Christianity. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of hearts and a lot of churches around the world, they go together. It is easy to become so bitter over our own hurts that we cannot see the hurts that the other person experiences. And the result then becomes relational gridlock. Godlike compassion toward the other party, however, includes seeing and feeling and trying to alleviate the suffering even of those who've mistreated us. See, it's easy for me to see, feel, and act when I love you. That just comes out. But how do I see, feel, and act when you have mistreated me? I would love to say I'm like, like our God, like, like Jesus, who on the cross is saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But if I was on the cross, I'd probably be like, Father, condemn them because this hurts. Let's be honest. Such compassion is what's required to break through this relational impasse. It requires us to have this compassion, to have peace, or to make peace where there was not peace before. And we see this again, the example par excellence is Jesus. Matthew 9, 35 through 36. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had to see. He was moved with compassion. He had to feel. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So what did he do? He healed them. Jesus saw. Jesus felt. Jesus acted. So to be per pursuing peace, to be peace pursuers, first of all, we have to be identified as compassionate. Next, kindness. Kindness. Kindness is showing mercy and doing good to those who do or do not deserve it. Gina last week talked about mercy. Mercy and grace and how they go together, but they're very different. Mercy is when I don't get what I do deserve, and grace is getting what I don't deserve. So kindness is showing mercy and doing good to those even if they don't deserve it. Luke 6, 35 through 36. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful or be kind just as your Father is kind. See, I'm good at lending with interest. Right? Let's be honest. What, what, what's in it for me? You need to borrow this? Sure. You need to borrow my car? Sure. But what do we expect when we get the car back? Full tank of gas. Right? Come on. No dents. Don't expect anything back. Here's the key on kindness. 
Kindness does not depend on the other person's character. Now, I got to be honest, that hurts. Kind of wish it did. Let's be honest, it'd be easier. Why well, should be kind to you because you're a kind person? But I'm allowed to be mean to you because you're mean. But I can't find it in Scripture. Kindness does not depend on the other person's character. It depends on us. God does not call us to show kindness to the other person because the other person deserves it. But because God deserves it. And because he wants his sons and daughters to act just like him. That's the hard part. Again, easy to be kind to those who deserve it. Not so easy. Or maybe it is for you, but not for me. Not so easy for me to be kind to those who I feel don't. Or I feel wronged me in some way. And then I have to be reminded, it doesn't, my kindness is not predicated on their deserving of it. But only because God calls me to it. These are getting hard, right? Compassion, kindness. It's why it's hard to be a peacemaker. It's why it's hard to find peace today. I don't know if you remember, but a few weeks ago I said like some 8,600 years of written history and there's been 240 recorded years of peace. In that time, 8,000 peace treaties have been made and broken. It's hard. First I've got to be compassionate and, humil and then I've got to be kind and there's still six more to go. Because now I have to be humble. Humility. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. So we have this misnomer that humility is low self-esteem. And that's not biblical. And that's actually a lie from Satan. Oh, I think I'm a terrible person, so I know God thinks I'm humble. No. No, God made you and thinks you're incredible. So your humility isn't low self-esteem. In fact, that's false humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. It's realizing everything is a gift from God. I prayed that over our offering today. It says it in James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. And when you realize that, then you can't be anything but humble. It doesn't say every good and perfect gift except. So you're like, well, then, then, then I'm allowed to feel good about this. No, every. Every. You know what every means? Every. Good and perfect gift is from above. 1 Peter 5.5 5, All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Who needs grace? You can raise your hand. I need grace. God gives it. I want it. All he'll give and more. I can't be proud. Humility. It means taking the last seat as a guest at someone's dinner table. The Bible says that. Wouldn't it feel weird you go and there's a big dinner table and there's that real big chair and everybody else is sitting on a bar stool and you sit in that chair because you think it's for you and then in front of everybody the, the host gets up and says, can you, can you move? The Bible even warns us, don't be like that. Instead, sit at the bar stool and let the host come and pick you up and say, no, no, you're at the seat of honor. It means, oh, it means letting the other car switch lanes in front of you. <laughs> Even though there's been markers and arrows saying merge for the last two miles. A bunch of cones. I'm wanting to get home just as quickly as you are. It means letting the car switch lanes in front of you. God, that is so hard. Or, or this, or it means waiting to go through the line at the next church potluck. Ooh. It means let somebody else get there first. 
humility, putting others above ourselves. Maybe you're good at the first three, but then we got gentleness. Well, we did. We have gentleness. And here's a, a, a real misnomer we need to understand is in the world a lot of times gentleness is confused with weakness. But it's very different. We see that Jesus, in my estimation, was one of the strongest men to ever live. Not necessarily physically. But to live the life he did requires strength. He wasn't weak. But was he gentle? Here's what it says, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Gentle. Gentle is an attitude. It's, it's, it's kind of an adjective even describing our actions. Do we speak in a gentle tone or do we speak harsh? Do we raise a hand to cause damage or lower a hand to raise somebody up? Is our spirit like the spirit of our very Lord one that is gentle? Not weak. Because in fact it takes more strength to turn the other cheek than to slap it in the first place. It's not weakness, but gentleness. There's also patience. I love this picture. The cat just waiting for a mouse to come out that hole. Patience. James 1.19, this is a verse that comes up on my phone. Uh, I have it as an alarm reminder. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Truth be told, most of the time, if we're honest, we usually do the very opposite. We're quick to speak, we're slow to hear, and we're quick to become angry. And then we wonder why our world is not full of peace. Listen to this from William Barclay, a, a pastor and author hundreds of years ago. Being long-suffering, long-fused, and long-tempered, towards those who irritate us. That's how he describes patience. It is the ability to bear with people, not to grow angry or bitter or irritated or annoyed with them, even when they are foolish or ungrateful or even apparently hopeless. It is the ability to serenely take people as they are, with all their faults and all their failings and with all the ways in which they hurt and wound us and never stop caring for them and bearing with them. I hate that definition. That's hard. Because truth be told, sometimes people are angry and I get angry. They're bitter, I feel bitter. I get irritated, I get annoyed. And I'm supposed to take them as they are and then I remember, oh God, you take me exactly how I am. And you call me to do the same. So patience. What does this patience look like in our daily lives? When most of us, if we're honest, we could usually encounter some sort of conflict almost on a daily basis. Even if it's just a conflict in our own minds. How well do you show self-restraint toward people who provoke you? What about boring people? You get caught at the little party and that one corners you in the corner, talks to you about whatever, and you're just like, you've got to be kidding me. Messy people. Okay, I'm kind of OCD and I love my house clean. You know, how do I feel if, if somebody comes over and messes up my house? Gabby people. Like, hey. Thick-headed people. Slow people. Slow people in the left lane. <laughs> it's not hard. Don't drive slow in the left lane. If you get nothing else of the rest of this message, don't drive slow in the left lane. Make your pastor happy. Thank you. 
says, how about drivers on the road? Don't they know I've got somewhere to be too? Amen. One day, okay, so we can put a man on the moon, right? One day they're going to create a car with something. I'm not sure what they're going to call it. But when you're going to turn, you could do something and you could let everybody else know you're turning. And when that happens, I'm going to be excited. I saw them in Florida, but in Indiana they don't make them. It'll get here. It's going to get here. I have faith. Patience. Again, it's easy to be patient with people we like, people we enjoy being around, people that make us the center of attention. But what about those who annoy us? Along with patience, we also have this big word, forbearance. Bearing with each other's needs. Bearing with each other's difficulties. I want to read you this quote I found as I was studying for this for this message, it says, I appreciate the Bible's realism. The Apostle Paul assumes that people will annoy us and that relationships will become tense. Just assumed. It's not if, it's when. Conflict is inevitable. Jesus knows that until he returns, there will be problems in his church. He knows that teens won't communicate well and that will frustrate their parents. He knows that husbands will leave socks on the floor. And wives will want to talk about all the times their husbands do. He knows that new church leaders will want to do things differently than the old church leaders. Oh, not here at Trinity. Okay, just kidding. Learning to bear with one another is an indispensable skill for pursuing peace in our daily lives. Forbearing, forbearance. I love it. The Bible doesn't assume, hey, you're going to become a Christian and you're going to get along with every other Christian. That's just how it works. It assumes that that's not true. It assumes that you're going to one day get a 40-something-year-old pastor who's covered in tattoos who says, we're going to change things. That's what it assumes. <laughs> Thank you, John. It assumes that we're going to have to forbear with one another part of being a peacemaker number seven christ-like forgiveness so now we've had to be patient we've had to be kind we've had to be gentle we've had to forbear with all these people we've had to graciously let people in the left lane and wave at them instead of other things to them it's required all of that and even when they still cut us off and they still didn't see the sign for two miles, now I have to forgive. I'm not good at that. In the car especially. Very few times has somebody cut me off and I've been like, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I pray that wherever they go, they get there wonderful and that you bless their day. But... The book of discipline in the Methodist church says I'm not allowed to say what I normally say from the pulpit. It's hard. we got to do all that, and then even if they don't get it, we still have to practice Christ-like forgiveness. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And actually, I think this is probably if not the greatest verse on forgiveness in the bible because it's so important because it says if possible so far as it depends on you and that's key i can only ask for forgiveness i can't grant it if i've wronged somebody the bible says i need to go seek out that brother or sister confess my ways and ask for forgiveness once i've done that i have accomplished what i was supposed to do i have been obedient the end. Now it's up to you to forgive me or not. I can't control that. And I feel like there's many people in churches today walking around feeling like, oh, I just wish I would be forgiven. And sometimes it's like, hey, yeah, we wish we would. Sometimes that person's not going to forgive you. And you aren't held responsible for that according to Scripture. Sometimes somebody might have hurt you and they're no longer even here. They've gone to eternity. You are not responsible for their response. You're just responsible for your end. Amen? 
And that, that, that there's grace in that. Hey, I, I screwed up. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Hopefully they say yes. Sometimes if they say no, what can I do? But as far as it depends on me, I'm supposed to live peaceably with everyone. These seven are really, really hard. Number eight encompasses them all. All of these previous examples make up number eight. Paul concludes, if you go back to Colossians 3.14, Paul concludes this list of eight with this. And over all of these virtues, over all of them, over all seven of the previous, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love. The umbrella that covers all of these virtues. Love. The apostle prioritizes love, our self-sacrificial giving for another's best interest as the most important virtue of them all. And Paul does that time and time again in his letters. Corinthians letter, faith, hope, and love exist, but the greatest of these, love. God is love. Of all the virtues put on love, the binding image here is apparently the picture of love as the outer garment that holds the other seven layers of clothing in place. Protects them all. When in doubt, love. Should I be compassionate toward that person or not? When in doubt, love. Should I be patient in this situation? When in doubt, love. And then he finishes this section, again, Mokta read it, Colossians 3.15. Once you do all this, here's what he says. Then let the peace, so here we are, peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Do these things. Clothe yourself with these seven virtues, then Put on that eighth virtue of love so that the peace of God can dwell in your hearts. Because as one body of believers, we were called to peace. I think that's why it's so tragic when we see church splits. I think that's why I'm having such a hard time with the United Methodist Church as they are eventually going to split. For a myriad of reasons. But we're one body. How can we witness to an outside world who is craving peace and craving authentic relationships when maybe there was times in the church past where we could say, okay, look at us. And unfortunately, I'm not so sure if we can always say that today. Oh, you want to see peace? Look at the church. Some of you have been around churches long enough. That's a laughable statement. And it breaks my heart. Because as one members of a body, you were called to peace. You want to be a peacemaker? You have to be compassionate. You have to be kind. You have to be humble. You have to be gentle. You have to be patient. You have to be forbearing. You have to be forgiving. You have to be loving. True peace. True peace is found in a heart full of love. Tomorrow I'm going to get on Facebook Live. Every once in a while I do a live stream. I'm going to start trying to do them more often to get messages out through that. Um, I think there's even a way we could post it on, on our website. I'll have to talk to our tech about that. But if you want tomorrow sometime, I'm not sure what time, but it'll be recorded. I'm going to look at four additional points on Christian peacemaking to kind of wrap this whole thing up. So it's one of those stay tuned or come back tomorrow. But I'm going to spend 10 or 12 minutes probably looking at four additional ideas of what it means to be a godly peacemaker. And I think one of the greatest examples of peace all throughout scripture is when 12 men who were so different in almost every way except one could sit around a table 
in fellowship together. Amen? Communion. The Eucharist. The Lord's Supper. Coming to the Lord's table. Whatever you call it. Communion should solidify a one body. A body that is joyous. Is at peace. And is full of love. And here at Trinity, we practice taking communion on the first Sunday of every month. Some of our friends maybe do it every week. Some people do it less often. We want it to do it on a more consistent basis, but where it never becomes rote because it's absolutely beautiful. And there's no greater way to symbolize peace than to take communion together. So we're going to go into that time. I'm going to ask Khalila if she would come up to slowly start to play. I want to read a little bit of scripture to you and then explain how we will take communion today. And I want to give a special shout out to Mokta and to Vicki who are our communion stewards. And every month they ask me basically what weird thing do you want to do this month and they do it and they make it happen. So Vicki, Mokta, thank you. We read these words in another letter of Paul's, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. It's long. I'm going to read it quickly because it's long, but I think it's worth looking up and maybe studying it this week on your own. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. And to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. You ever been around a, a kid, um, I won't get, I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an example, but I'll, I'll change the name to protect the innocent. We used to do a lot of meals here for, uh, after our fireside cafe, and one time, uh, oh, man, maybe two years ago, we ordered pizza, and uh, the kids were with us and everything, and uh, so we kind of let them go first, and this one kid from the neighborhood just went and like took like five pieces of pizza before anybody else got any. Many of you remember who it was. And kind of like <coughs> licks them or something so nobody else can take them. Right? Because that's his mentality, but that's what was going on here. They were coming to do the Lord's work and to eat together, and they were kind of doing this. This is mine. Well, they were getting drunk. Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? I certainly cannot. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by his blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. We'll have time to do that here in a minute. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. Now, we got a few more verses to read. But when I was a kid, that freaked me out. Like, there were years I didn't take communion at my churches. Because I'm like, what if I'm unworthy? I could die? But when you understand what that scripture means, what was unworthy was what I said earlier. They were hoarding everything. They were not sharing with their neighbor. They had no concern for the poor among them. 
that they didn't do this as community. It wasn't that they were perfect because you're not and you won't be. You're only worthy to be at this table because of what Jesus did for each and every one of us. So if you're here today and you think you need to be perfect, no, this table is open and you're not going to die. I honestly, when I was a kid, I was freaked out. It's like, man, I ain't, I ain't drinking that. But when we're together as a family of God, we are taking it in a worthy manner. Amen. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this yet way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined that we will not be condemned along with the world. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. So what was happening is these people were sitting there thinking, hey, first Sunday of the month at Trinity, I get a free meal not what this is about so they'd come starving eat as much as they can get the first ones in line you know what it kind of reminds me of i'm going to really make somebody mad here it reminds me of some of the people that come when we do meet your neighbor i'm gonna sit in the front row i'm gonna sit at the closest table and i'm gonna knock the old lady over so she can knock that kid over so i can get in line first we wait on each other this isn't a time where we're going to satisfy our hunger and our thirst, but it's a time to remember what was done for us 2,000 years ago. Amen.